tonight, putting parts of Canada on alert as some communities face winter's wrath with tragic consequences. Arctic air and heavy snow. It's pretty bad out here. The perfect storm of health hazard. We had two events that paramedics were called for cardiac arrest. And an unprecedented plea to prevent the power grid from going down. Navigating an icy road to nomination. I know it's cold, but we need you out there. Republican presidential hopefuls vie for votes ahead of the Iowa caucuses. Ready to make some history on Monday night. Plus, a game-changing piece of equipment in minor sports. Just because he's a midget! Something needs to be done. The rise of body cameras to curb abuse against referees. CTV National News with Heather Butts. Good evening. The record-breaking Arctic cold snap sweeping across much of the country is not letting up tonight, disrupting flights, NFL games, and may have a major impact on the first votes of the 2024 presidential election. The winter weather pummeling both sides of the Canada-U.S. border, not only troublesome, but tragic. CTV's Tony Grace reports. In Ontario's snow belt today, vehicles seemingly disappearing into relentless lake effect squalls. And snowblowers going non-stop in the effort to stay ahead of an expected 50 centimetres or more. We've had such a lovely winter so far, but suddenly it all came out of nowhere. A story playing out in many places near the Great Lakes. Buffalo, New York, once again in the thick of it. It's pretty bad out here. With warnings of 70 centimeters or more, an area that knows blizzards all too well, taking no chances. A state of emergency. The Bills-Steelers playoff game postponed, a local travel ban in place, and the Peace Bridge border crossing closed. Go Bills! These Canadians among the snowbound. The wind and the snow is unbelievable. It was, it was just coming down sideways, blowing us over. But safe as they waited out. We had the yesterday plan and today planned and it's kind of been put on, put on pause right now. Back in Ontario where there weren't squalls, there was still wind whipping up snow from a storm system earlier this weekend. A storm that kept paramedics west of Ottawa especially busy. At times this weekend was overwhelming. With calls ranging from slips and falls to collisions and sadly two deaths in the Pembroke area. One person in their 50s, another in their 70s, suffering fatal heart attacks while shoveling. The paramedics arrived, uh, confirmed they were cardiac arrests, treated on scene, uh, and transported to local hospitals. Uh, unfortunately, those patients were later pronounced. Doctors urging everyone not to underestimate the risks. People don't always fully appreciate how much stress that puts on the heart. Doctors also underscoring the potential for exposure to the extreme cold to turn deadly as Arctic air that's been gripping Western Canada pushes east this week, sending temperatures plummeting into the minus 20s, 30s and lower. Heather. CTV's Tony Grace in Toronto tonight. As Tony mentioned, that bitter cold still gripping Western Canada. The icy wind created the perfect conditions for a winter phenomenon called sea smoke on Okanagan Lake. The temperature is breaking records in several Alberta communities where it dropped below minus 40. Western provinces through the prairies have been under extreme cold warnings for days now. The temperatures are not only breaking records, the deep freeze is causing power problems in Alberta. High demand putting so much pressure on the electrical grid, officials issued an emergency alert for the third straight night, warning of a high risk of rotating power outages. CTV's Colton Prale explains. In this prairie deep freeze, heating can be a matter of life and death. It's why unprecedented emergency alerts by the Alberta electric system operator asking people to reduce their power consumption are raising concerns. We were in a situation where the next step to again maintain that overall grid stability is that we uh, would have to have rotating blackouts. Why don't these buildings turn off all of their lights? But as Albertans rush to turn off the lights, downtown skylines and provincial buildings stayed brightly lit something Alberta says will change going forward. Obviously, there's more work we want to do. We are now reaching out to businesses, 
and, and people in those those high high rises to say what else can we do to make sure everybody is doing what they can. Across the country, extreme weather is threatening Canada's electrical grid. A new report from North America's electricity watchdog shows British Columbia, Ontario and the Maritimes are all at an elevated risk of blackouts. And that risk is expected to grow as demand doubles by 2050. Right across North America, there's increasing concerns with respect to medium to long-term reliability because the margins uh, are getting shorter and getting tighter. Prairie premiers are using the situation to take aim at Ottawa over its goal for a net zero electrical grid by 2035. A target experts say will be a monumental challenge, especially as the country aims to build more electricity generation in the next 25 years than any time in the past century. I mean, we can't even uh, trade beer across provincial borders, and we think we're going to be trading a billion dollars worth of electricity over the next coming decades. So we've got a tremendous amount of work to do. Experts say this level of electrification will cost over a trillion dollars and require a level of cooperation between the provinces and the feds that simply isn't happening. But they say the situation cannot be ignored. Demand is going up, and it's up to Canada to build a grid to match it. Heather. All right, thanks, Colton. Nearly 96 million Americans are under wind chill alerts as a new wave of Arctic air blasts the United States. The cold snap surging from the West Coast to the Great Lakes in Oregon. A deadly storm left thousands in the dark. Fallen trees damaged several homes and cars. In Iowa, the bone-chilling cold is playing out during a major political event, the first contest of the 2024 race for the White House. Republican rivals making pitches in the frigid conditions. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver reports from Iowa tonight. There is a last-minute scramble in Iowa as candidates work to secure support among registered Republicans who are battling heavy snow and temperatures of nearly minus 40 degrees with the wind chill to make sure their vote counts. We are caucusing for Trump. Pro life, I guess. Um, that would be a really key point for me. In terms of, of the Republican movement, I feel like DeSantis really is uh, someone who we can be excited about. Polls show former U.S. President Donald Trump is on a runaway train about 30 points ahead of his next competitor. That kind of a lead will be extremely hard for anyone to surpass. That's why all eyes are on the high stakes battle for second between former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. Tomorrow's going to be going to be fun for us. And Florida Governor uh, Ron DeSantis. When, um, all polling indicates a, a blowout by Donald Trump exceeding all prior uh, records of the, the, the distance between the number one candidate, the winner, and the number two candidate uh, amongst Republicans. This caucus is all about momentum and bragging rights. Only 40 delegates are up for grabs, but a win or strong showing in Iowa sets the tone and groundwork for the months of voting ahead. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson considers himself the anti-Trump, but his support among Republicans voting tomorrow is extremely low. It says that they uh, are buying into uh, Donald Trump's arguments about grievance and about anger, and I think that's a short-term strategy, so I see that changing over time. But it takes leaders, it takes candidates like myself that has a a message of normalcy. But after hundreds of campaign events and visits to Iowa, some of the support the candidates are banking on may not be there tomorrow. There are fears extreme weather, including temperatures of nearly minus 40 degrees with the wind chill, Heather, will keep some registered Republicans home. All right, CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver in Iowa for us tonight. Thank you. Turning now to the war between Israel and Hamas, marking 100 days of death and destruction. CTV's Jeremy Sharon on the grim milestone. As the sun set on this 100th day of war in Gaza, this backdrop now unchanged for more than three months. Death and destruction has persisted as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to eliminate Hamas. No one will stop us, he says. Not the Hague, not the axis of evil, and no one else. His cabinet today began voting on a new amended budget for the year, with billions in new spending to fund the fight against Hamas. In the enclave, there is no reprieve. Overnight strikes in central Gaza killed at least 15 people. Allah. The Hamas-run health ministry says almost 24,000 have been killed and 60,000 wounded since the war began. 
After 100 days of war, I come here every day, says this Palestinian. We still have three children remaining under the rubble, Omar, Abdullah and Masa. Along Israel's northern border with Lebanon, Hezbollah has claimed responsibility for attacks today that killed two people, further fueling fears of a widening conflict. In Tel Aviv, thousands gathered in an overnight protest against their government, pleading for the return of hostages still held captive. The one thing that this government has to do is to stop the war. Now tonight there is word negotiators have struck a deal that would allow medicine to be delivered to the more than 40 hostages still held in Gaza, but it's not yet clear when or exactly how that will happen. Heather? Jeremy, thank you. And protesters in Canada mark this grim milestone as they have since the start of the war. In Toronto, hundreds took to the streets to highlight the toll of Israel's invasion and constant bombardment on Gaza, while family members of hostages called for an immediate release of those still held captive. We are here to speak up and scream for them because they cannot do it. Demonstrators in Vancouver remembered the brutal attack on October 7th. Palestinian families gathered to build kites in solidarity with Gaza's children. Ottawa is set to look at the possibility of putting a cap on the number of international students coming to Canada. It comes as the federal government faces criticism for increasing immigration numbers while the country faces a housing crisis. CTV's Kamal Kramali reports. Students abroad looking to study in Canada could hit a new hurdle. The immigration minister today telling CTV's question period he's looking at putting a cap on the number of international students. That volume is disconcerting. Uh, it's really a system that has gotten out of control. It's the federal government's response to a housing on affordability crisis. It isn't the one size fits all solution to addressing all of housing problems in Canada, um, but this is certainly in some areas contributing to some of the, the, the pressure that we're seeing. The number of study permit holders in Canada has been rising since the mid-2000s, with only a dip during the pandemic. There were more than 800,000 international students in 2022, with 2023's numbers projected to go up even more. This is very, very uh, reckless decision, I would say. Now growing concern, the new proposed limit will leave plenty of students who have already applied for schools in the lurch. We already started receiving inquiries from uh, students who are living abroad or prospective students uh, basically uh, panicking, saying like, what should I do? Should I apply now? Still, there are questions on how Ottawa would impose the cap when it's up to schools to approve applications, a system that benefits their bottom line since international students pay roughly three times more for tuition than domestic students. Make international tuition equal to domestic tuition. The moment you do that, then there's really no incentive for universities to bring in these students because it's a financial incentive. Meanwhile, the country's largest post-secondary association, Colleges and Institutes Canada, says it's troubled by the idea of a cap on study permits, adding it'll continue to advocate for its international student program. Heather. All right, Kamal, thank you. A touching tribute in Montreal today, honoring renowned Quebec entrepreneur Daniel Langlois and Dominique Marchand, who were murdered in December on the Caribbean island of Dominica, where they owned an eco-friendly resort. Bonsoir tout le monde et bienvenue à Friends and colleagues paid their respects to the family at a cinema the couple founded. It is inspiring what they started to protect this, uh, the, the idea and the, the values they have of uh, protecting the environment, uh, sharing with the community. Their bodies were found in a burned-out car. At least two people have been charged in the deaths. Langlois is remembered as a visionary and a pioneer of 3D animation. Coming up, Bitcoin breakthrough. I think with these products, what you'll see is a new participants coming to the market. How U.S. regulatory changes are opening new doors for investors.
In a move seen as a landmark moment in the history of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin is hitting mainstream markets. The major U.S. regulatory decision this week is expected to attract billions in investment. It's a major shift in the acceptance of crypto. CTV's Kevin Gallagher has more on the opportunities and potential pitfalls. Bitcoin has gone from niche digital currency to mainstream stock market security after U.S. regulators approved a new way to invest in it this week. Well, the bullish narrative is that this is a new big on-ramp to crypto, which is going to attract a lot more, a lot more investors. The Securities and Exchange Commission decision allows major Wall Street firms to offer spot Bitcoin exchange traded funds, known colloquially as ETFs. Bitcoin is currently valued at more than $62,000. These ETF shares are expected to cost much less while being pegged to the value of the cryptocurrency. I think with these products, what you'll see is a new uh, new participants coming to the market that otherwise wouldn't have felt comfortable or in many cases wouldn't have been able to participate in the industry. Market analysts predict this will attract billions in investment. Bitcoin's value already surged 70 percent since October in anticipation of approval. SEC has rejected another round of attempts to have an ETF. Previous attempts have been rejected by regulators over fears Bitcoin securities would be vulnerable to manipulation. Bitcoin value surged, then plummeted just the day before the decision after hackers compromised the SEC Twitter account, forcing the chair to admit false ETF approval was given. It was clearly a black eye for the SEC. Bitcoin was created in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis as a hedge to the traditional financial system. The irony here being that uh, something that was supposed to be de decentralized and unregulated is now being centralized and regulated in some cases. Financial analysts call this a game-changing moment for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies after a series of high-profile scandals. Kevin Gallagher, CTV News, Ottawa. Loblaw is facing criticism for ending its 50% discounts on products nearing their expiry. With food costs soaring, shoppers say every penny counts. Uh, in this time when the grocery stores are making record profits, this is one minor way that they can give a little bit extra to the uh, customer for goods that are about to expire. Experts say close to 20% of Canadians look for the bright red stickers indicating half-off sales. They'll be replaced with 30% reductions. In an email to the Agri-Food Lab, the grocery giant said it's moving to a more consistent price strategy in line with competitors. Still ahead, a tool to tackle rising abuse against referees. More minor sports leagues consider the use of body cameras. Sports leagues across the country are grappling with the growing levels of abuse towards referees who face toxic or threatening comments from parents and coaches. It has led to a new line of defense for some associations. CTV's Sarah Plowman on the latest leagues now sporting body cameras. In games for fun, fans are fouling. Parents have been a lot more vocal. Uh, players, coaches, uh, really going after officials hard. Aggression not new, but now more frequent and at times personal. It's coming out of stands and waiting for officials outside of venues. It got so bad. In December, a Halifax minor basketball league told fans one weekend, stay home. In Quebec's eastern townships, soccer refs will soon sport body cameras to capture if abuse happens and try to prevent it. Something needs to be done in order to recruit new referees as well as retain the ones we have. The move follows trials in England and Ontario that turned to cameras because refs were turning away from the sport. While data is preliminary. It's definitely, uh, they feel it's operating as a visual deterrent. They're seeing changes in behaviors. Where this goes in the long term, we do not, we do not know yet. We'll have a full report at this time next year. Some soccer organizations hope body cameras aren't needed. At Soccer Lac St. Louis, the focus 
is on good reporting. So it's uh, allowing our referees to be able to report these incidents, feel comfortable reporting them, and then it's up to us to track the data and really pinpoint uh, the problematic, you know, people. At most games, play is just play. But when harassment is hurled, the head of referees in New Brunswick says you have to deal with those who are abusive. He doubts body cameras are the right call for basketball, but believes education is. People that are going out to referee are people with everyday lives, everyday jobs, and they're people that are out there trying to do the best job that they can. They're not making mistakes on purpose. They're not trying to make one team win over the other team. They're just trying to call as fair a game as they possibly can. So games can go on. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, St. John. After the break, a hero in pajamas pays it forward. We're finishing our newscast with the power of positivity. A BC senior is making a difference in the lives of people and animals in her community, and she's doing much more than just paying it forward. Here's CTV's Adam Sawatsky. Well, Alora the dog is dressed to impress. So is her owner, Judy Bobke. Uh, this is dressed up for me. <laughs> Judy says she's usually too focused on rescuing dogs to care about clothes. I get calls, it doesn't matter what time, the day or night, and I go. Which means the volunteer is often spotted wearing pajamas outside her house. Let's go! And occasionally after being locked out of her car by one of her rescues. A, a dog will jump up and hit the button, and I'm standing there going, oh, you got to be kidding. <laughs> a comical inconvenience, as opposed to Judy's devastating diagnosis. My whole world to, 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 fell apart. Judy says she couldn't endure multiple health issues, including two bouts of cancer, without the unwavering support of her human friends and the unconditional love of her furry ones. So she committed to pay it forward. Because it keeps me going every day, knowing that I can help the people and animals. Over the past few years, Judy has raised tens of thousands of dollars through initiatives like Bottle Drives to support women's shelters, community youth centers, and help the elderly pay their bills. She's got a huge heart, and it beats bigger every day, man. She's just a, she's a hero around here, as far as I'm concerned. A hero who, rather than donning a cape, will get into a goofy costume to support sick kids on their birthdays or raise the spirits of patients waiting in hospital for serious surgeries. I just started crying, actually, because it was just such a beautiful thing to do. But Judy doesn't want compliments for her kindness. I'm very uncomfortable. Although she was recently notified she'd rescued and paid for the vet bills of almost 500 animals. That's pretty special, actually. Judy's quick to credit all her accomplishments with the people in the community she serves. It takes a village, and I've got the village, and that gives me the hope um, to carry on. Adam Sawatsky, CTV News, Cobble Hill. Such a positive outlook. That is our show for this Sunday night. I'm Heather Potts. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Sandy and Omar are back tomorrow. Good night.